thanks for uh, uh, Blue Hat for having bring me here to Tel Aviv. Uh, it's a beautiful venue and a really bang up job you guys did on the uh, on the, all the decorations out there. Um, my computer went to sleep, so just go ahead and wake it up. Are we good? There we go. So um, the top the topic of the talk is going to be about supply chain security um, with the subtext of if I were a nation state. And so um, some people have asked me, is this in response to the big Bloomberg article that came out? Actually, uh, the topic was picked about a month before the article came out. I was invited to give the talk, and I said, hey, guys, what do you want me to talk about out here? And they're like, oh, it'd be cool if you uh, gave a talk about um, supply chain security. I was like, sure. And then like about a, a month later, that article comes out. I'm like, OK, well, that's, that's pretty topical. Um, <laughs> we're going to have to make a couple adjustments to the talk, but uh, overall the idea is um, essentially if you had uh, a large amount of resources, more than I have, um, what are the sorts of things that we should actually be worrying about in terms of supply chain security? So first, a little about my background. I'm a hardware guy. Um, that means that when everyone was doing the dot-com thing, I was wasting a lot of time uh, building stuff like this, all the wires, all the sorts of things. Um, time passes. A lot of my friends go off and do more software stuff. People put away their soldering irons. Uh, people start outsourcing their supply chains. And uh, eventually, this comes to the point where people start putting, um, using hardware um, as security routes and as enclaves. And so if I'm to be believed, that phrase there basically roughly translates to, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is a king. So uh, in, in the world where you know, everyone had forgotten how to solder and how to build circuit boards, um, this is a, a, actually a, a picture of a board I put inside the original uh, Microsoft Xbox to extract uh, the security keys that were uh, uh, being passed on a high-speed bus between the South Bridge and the CPU. Um, and back then, it was relatively easy to go ahead and uh, build one of these things. It took just a couple weeks, and you can pull out the keys now. You have to do uh, much more heroics um, to go ahead and uh, pull um, keys out of the, the trusted routes. Um, after that, uh, sort of little stint, you know, playing around with the, uh, the Xbox, I decided I wanted to do something a little different, so I spent a few years um, designing silicon. Um, this is a nanophotonic integrated uh, chip that I worked on at a company called Luxterra, and the really interesting part about this is that I got exposed to the roots and the nitty-gritty of how to actually design transistors on silicon, how to do layer stacks, how to manage fab, how to build packages, these sorts of things, and that will become relevant. That experience will, be, will uh, actually comes into relevance later in the talk. Uh, nowadays, I mostly spend my time building systems, so here's a few of the things I've sort of uh, played around with um, in, the, in, the, in recent years, um, which means basically I spend a lot of time dealing with supply chains. Um, and supply chains are inherently not a friendly territory. So this is an example of a chip that um, was actually sent to me by a friend. This is a um, ST, uh, purports to be a, um, a sort of a secure microcontroller. He bought a bunch of them. They weren't behaving. He sent them to me, took the top off the chip, uh, put it in a microscope, and found out that on the inside, it was not actually a micro that microcontroller is labeled on the inside. It was actually um, an LCX244, which is like an 8-bit TTL buffer. Not a very interesting chip, but, but, it, but, it, but it tells you um, about sort of already there's a bit of uh, subtext about people um, playing shenanigans in the supply chain. Another problem I had was um, I uh, had to source SD cards, buy them. I had some SD cards from a vendor called Kingston. They weren't behaving correctly. They weren't uh, according to spec. And so I went to the gray markets, bought a whole bunch of them, digested off the top with acid, took pictures of all the chips on the inside, learned more about the structure of the cards, and found some really interesting sort of correlations between what was purporting to be a real chip and what were some patent fakes, for example. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot. The, the level of sophistication people are going to build these um, sort of fake uh, memory cards is, is quite high. They're stacking chip on chip, doing wire bonding, encapsulation, packaging, and marking. Another um, example of a, of a problem that I had was uh, I uh, built a, a little board, it's open source, um, that has an FPGA on it. And I had a problem where in production, about 3% of the boards were failing a particular part of the test. We put them aside. Later on, they were sent to me. And one thing I finally noticed about them is that all of the FPGAs that were failing had this little square here. If you look over here, here's a bigger picture of this square. This square here is a, someone had put it in a laser etcher and just blasted off what was underneath the, here, the letters ES for engineering sample. So someone had gone and recovered engineering sample FPGAs, or they're meant to be ground up, 
had blasted off the letters and put them back into the supply chain. Of course, we had a check to check the part number before it goes in, but the worker just saw a square. This, it's not, you know, it didn't say don't not accept the square, so the part number was valid. It got put onto the boards. So um, I brought up the issue to the uh, contract manufacturer I was working with at the time, AQS. CEO was sitting there, and then like all the managers and that sort of stuff. And it was really interesting. His first reaction was he looked around the table and says, okay, if anyone in this room is responsible for this, you have one chance now to, to fess up to it. Um, and I, and you know, well, the punishment will be less severe, right? So the first thing he knew was that inside his own company, there could be people playing the cheating game. And he wanted to clear himself of that first, right? So no one, of, of course, no one fessed up to it. And then so then we started looking down the supply chain. You know, who are the distributors? Are we all about going all the way back to Xilinx? Where are the places um, the injection could have happened? And people, like when we called up distributors, they're like, oh, it must have been the courier. The courier intercepted the packages and took the chips out and, and swapped them. Oh, it must have been in your, your warehouse. Someone broke into your warehouse and stole the chips. The line worker swapped it out at the, at the line or something like this. So you know, just the blame game was going back and forth, back and forth. It turned out at the end of the day, we had a couple of distributors for the FPGA. One of them was this Chinese company. Um, and, uh, and most likely it came from that one and not Avnet. We tried to report the issue to Xilinx. Unfortunately, this Chinese distributor had so much leverage on that supply chain, Xilinx couldn't afford to disqualify them. So they continued to sell through those guys, and we ended up at a settlement where they just sent us replacements for the chips that were bad. Um, so why would they do it for just 3% of the chips? You know, why would they like, blend them in? It seems like a lot of effort and a lot of risk for what seems like not a reward, except if you consider the fact that the distributor margin's only about 3 or 5% to start with, if you blend them in at a rate of about 3, or 3 to 5%, you've doubled their margin, right? So it's actually a huge amount of money for those people who are involved in the supply chain to pull off an attack like this. And also, when you blend it at a rate of a, of a few percent, it sort of kind of mixes in with the other noise of manufacturing. Like, like I said, when the issue happened on the line, we just set them aside. We didn't, it didn't set off any red flags. Like, like 3% could be a soldering error, could be something else. So it, was a it took us a long time to even catch the problem. So that's sort of a little bit of background about how Supply chains can be hostile even if security is not involved. Um, now, if we want to think about sort of a security basis for supply chain attacks, um, let's talk a little bit about sort of like the whys, the whats, and the wheres of, of supply chain attacks. Like, why would you want to do it? Uh, what might you do? And where might it happen? And that's, this is going to be the bulk of the talk. So um, why do you want to you know, attack a supply chain? Well, um, there's obviously people want help getting in, so you want, you, know, you want to have back doors inside hardware to assist with getting your rootkits and exploits in. Sometimes you want to get things out. Um, it may be difficult to exfiltrate data, or you want a more subtle way to exfiltrate your data, or you just want to sabotage equipment um, through some sort of selective defeat or destruction of equipment um, in the case of cyber warfare, warfare or ransomware or something like this. There's probably other reasons as well, but we'll just pick these three as a sort of a, 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 a basis to talk about supply chains. So uh, getting in. Uh, a backdoor can serve as a beachhead for a rootkit, uh, remote system access or persistence. Um, I mean, as the previous talk has demonstrated, some vendors already build backdoors into the systems and sell them to you, so your work, the work is already done. Uh, but in some cases, people want to go ahead and, for example, tamper with the management engine, um, add some implants inside of the, um, inside of the management um, interfaces to go ahead and assist with uh, um, getting backdoors into the, into the, into the hardware. Exfiltration is also another reason. Um, so this is uh, uh, people I'm pretty sure are familiar with um, the ant catalog from the NSA, um, from the Snowden leaks. Um, this is an example of an implant you can put inside a video cable that will go ahead and um, radiate uh, what's going on in the screen. Um, and so that an attacker nearby can go ahead and exfiltrate what's the, the content of the screen with the radio receiver. Um, there's also other ways, uh, for example, if, you, if your hard drive reports X amount of gigabytes and you do a secure wipe, but actually there's a little cache of data on the side that's unwipable, it can be used for exfiltration of data as well. Uh, mobile has a unique uh, opportunity for exfiltration of data. Um, in particular, mobile devices are very helpful for leaking the information on targets. And there's also an enhan enhanced opportunities in a mobile scenario for direct access to the hardware, so evil maid style attacks. Um, and near-field access to the hardware. And uh, in terms of sabotage, um, it, of course, you, know, you can imagine scenarios where if you could uh, have a selective defeat of hardware based on a remote command, that could be extremely useful, particularly uh, to nation states interested in engaging in, in cyber warfare or ransomware. 
Um, so uh, now let's talk a bit about the what. This is a bit of a big diagram. We're going to go through each of these blobs one at a time. The idea is what might you do uh, to attack a supply chain? And this uh, diagram it has two axes. The uh, vertical axis is, um, call this here, is the detection difficulty, right? So I sort of have it in a, in a I, I ranked it from um, easy to hard. So easiest is visual. You just look at it and you're like, huh, there's something there that shouldn't be there. Uh, harder is sort of you need some equipment, specialized equipment to either an x-ray or you have to use a meter to, to detect the presence. And on the bottom, the most difficulty would be if you had to pull off the chip, put in a scanning electron microscope, and look for the implants. Um, the, uh, on the other sort of axis is sort of the execution difficulty. Um, so, you know, on the right-hand side, the easiest uh, sort of attacks take seconds to execute and cost less than a buck. Um, and the hardest ones can cost millions of dollars and take months to plan and perhaps pull off. And these sort of dashed lines here, I sort of, I, I, I want to sort of, if you were to spin custom ICs to make these attacks a little more effective, it gets a little more expensive, but on a log scale, it it's, you know, sort of just pushes out a little bit further into that region. So let's, um, let's start with uh, the first sort of easiest stuff, component substitutions, right? These are just taking components out and swapping them for other components. Super easy to execute. Um, uh, you would think that they're relatively easy to detect, so they ought to be on the easy side, but they can actually, something can be very hard to detect. So if you ever looked at a, a circuit board, you'll see plenty of resistors and capacitors. These resistors have no labels. They all look the same. They could be zero ohms. They could be hundreds of mega ohms. You have no idea. Capacitors look all the same, basically. There's no way for you to really tell what they are unless you pull them off. In fact, if you just put a meter on the board and try to measure it, other circuits around these can mask the actual value of those, of those parts as well. So it, it can be difficult to tell um, uh, if a component has been swapped. And this is actually, you know, in manufacturing, this is a classic problem in itself. I always sweat bullets that not someone's attacking my supply chain. Someone just put the wrong reel in the machine, and now I've got the wrong resistor in the wrong spot. Um, so the mechanisms um, that can be in play when you do a bomb swap um, is that you can modify, for example, bootstrap options. Chips will determine perhaps which interface to read the code from initially based upon a strapping resistor. Changing that resistor from zero ohms to a very large value or vice versa can, can change the boot behavior. It can also help with things like if you want to do remote cha um, side channel attacks, um, if you reduce the amount of capacitance on a particular device, it makes the supply noise much um, larger. And you can go ahead and assist with um, those styles of attacks. Uh, for also, row hammering, a lot of people here, I think, are familiar with row hammering. Um, it's very dependent upon the structure of the DRAM chip itself. This is a micrograph of the DRAM chip, and essentially, you're swinging the adjacent wires around to try and induce a fault inside um, a memory cell. So the solution to you know, hardening against row hammering, hammering part of it is, well, why don't we just make sure we accept only ex authentic chips that are like, proven to be hardened against row hammering? So this is a wonderful... You know, memory, it's by Kingston, it's got the authenticity label, it's got the labeling, all that sort of stuff. Except, you know, you have to look a little bit deeper in that. Fun fact, Kingston doesn't have a fab. They don't make memory chips, so how is it they have chips with their name on it? If you go to a site like DRAM ex uh, Exchange, they actually sh uh, post the spot price of DRAM. You can get, you know, check it on it, it's like a stock market kind of thing. And you'll notice that one of the memory chips is like much, much cheaper than the others, and it has this term ETT after it. What does ETT stand for? Well, ETT um, is actually for RAM that is effectively untested or un, uh, effectively tested or untested. It turns out that RAM manufacturers can oftentimes produce memory at a rate faster than they can test them. So they come off the wafer fab, and there's a backup at the testing machines. So for them to go ahead and try to monetize their fabs faster, they'll go ahead and sell chips that are not tested or eff effectively tested. So they're just spot tested. Um, they're blank and unmarked, and then other manufacturers pick them up and are supposed to, scouts on or test them, mark them as their own brand, and then sell them out. Guess what? This is a, you know, a perfect opportunity for people to go ahead and swap around chips inside the uh, supply chain, even though they may be marked as one thing, they could have another chip on the inside. Another sort of uh, attack that can uh, happen through a simple bomb swap is a mobile device identif identification. So if you were to take a radio signal from um, a mobile phone, put in a spectrum analyzer, and look at it, you'll see a particular shape to the spectrum coming out. This shape is actually um, almost required by law. You can't transmit in the sidebands, 
And this, you know, this actual shape on the top is, is very consistent from device to device. And part of what allows you to achieve this is there's actually a passive filter on the back end of your power amplifier of your mobile phone to create that shape. If you were to go ahead and tamper with that filter, you'll actually see sidebands start appearing on the edge in this, in this band here where it shouldn't be. And sort of like in that matrix where they have that red woman who walks through the sea of black, you know, black suits, since everyone's phones here passes verification, the one person who has a tampered um, radio that has, doesn't have the filter side is going to stick out. You'll know that that person is near. You can sort of identify a particular target um, through a modified RF filter. Um, so that's uh, component substitution. Let's talk about adding components. So let's just put another component inside the device that shouldn't be there. And this is the one that a lot of people think about. This, is, uh, this took you know, the headlines with the Bloomberg Business Week, is put this little component on the inside. If we make it really small, maybe no one will notice. Or you know, NSA had created implants that go inside of the um, Ethernet jack or inside USB jacks to go ahead and, um, and uh, exfiltrate data or do something else to the machine. Um, and so adding components is relatively easy to detect. You can either see it in there or you can see it in an x-ray. So let's talk about x-rays a little bit. So this is a, a, a Novena motherboard, a circuit board that I made uh, once upon a time. I had a friend with a CT x-ray machine. We stuck in there, decided to look around, poke around, see what it looks like. Um, this is what the motherboard looks like under the x-ray. So there's some things that are really obvious. You look inside like the Ethernet uh, ports and you see the, the transform. This is perfectly normal. These are the, trans uh, the transformers on the inside. They're the hybrid that are required uh, by spec. Uh, but then if you look at, for example, these are the chips, right? You say, OK, well, what I'm looking at here, like, what, what's going on? Is this thing here the silicon? Actually, it turns out this is not the silicon. This is actually a large solder pad underneath the chip. And the solder itself is very dense. It blocks the x-ray. So it actually masks the presence of the silicon. You, it's very hard to tell where the chip is in, inside an x-ray, which brings me to the next interesting sort of exploit space, um, which is adding a chip inside of a package, right? So uh, chips, multiple chips inside packages, is a uh, sort of well-established technology. As I had sort of alluded to in the um, uh, at micro SD card uh, example, there's chips on top of memory chips to control them. In fact, today, you can get um, sort of 16, 17 chips inside a single package when you have your little micro, uh, high density micro SD cards. It's a very mature technology. Um, and so the thing that they use to do this is a technology called wire bonding. Um, if you were to take a standard, for example, dip chip, take off the top, you would see the silicon on the inside, and you would see these little wires coming off the edge of the chip. Those are the wire bonds. Uh, if you were to look inside of a USB key, for example, they're made by taking chips. Uh, stick them directly onto a circuit board and wire bonding them down the circuit board and encapsulating them with plastic. Um, this is what the wire bonds look like in sort of a microscope view. This is the chip, and you can see these little thin wire bonds coming off the chip down onto the circuit board. Uh, once the wire bond is done, uh, the chip is usually encapsulated. So in the case of a uh, chip on board, you get the little black you know, blob on it. Uh, in the case of actual chips, it goes into overmolding machine, so it looks a little bit nicer. Wire bonding process itself, let's see if we can get this video to start, um, is actually very fast. So this is actually a wire bonding machine. It's not in a clean room. I'm it's me with the camera standing next to them in regular street clothes. Happens very quickly. The operator just swaps in boards. It finds the chips, goes ahead and puts the wire bonds down. This machine here, you can buy it uh, on the second hand market for tens of thousands of dollars. It's not super expensive. Um, if you want to do a custom wire bond, uh, you go, this guy here programs the machine, he does it. He sees, basically has like an image uh, he sees through the microscope. He designates where the wire bond goes, and he hits a button and remembers those positions. And you can see here, the actual specification is a, is a PNG that I made, that I mailed, emailed to the guy. He's looking on his phone, counting where the wire bond should go. He's going to go back to the screen and sort of uh, identify where those bonds go. And then um, once he designates all the points, the machine remembers where all those wire bonds should go, has a little bit of uh, vision recognition to make sure it's aligned up, and it just replays and replays and replays and replays um, to go ahead and do it. So wire, wire bonding is very accessible. Um, it's very versatile. You can do chip on chip. Um, and so now when you want to go ahead and look inside of chips and sort of look for implants, there's a bit of a challenge because actually um, some chips intentionally have multiple chips on the inside. This is an example of a mobile, pho a mobile phone chipset from MediaTek. 
I put in an x-ray just so I was curious to see. I actually just want to know how big the die was. And I was surprised to see if you know how to read these things, you can, you'll see there's about six or seven separate silicon pieces inside of here. Each of them are, are from different manufacturers. And I was like, OK, why do they do this? If you look at their SKU matrix, it turns out they offer the same like, part as a single package with multiple memory options, different power amplifier options, different radio bands. And so instead of spinning a bunch of different masks for different uh, SKUs, they just um, put them on a single substrate, wire bond them together, and then sell them to you on the outside as a single chip. So if I were to try and take this and I say, OK, I'm going to put this in the x-ray and try and figure out if someone's got an implant on the inside, it could just be the manufacturing changing uh, vendors for the memory chip, for example. It, it, nothing malicious at all. Um, and then if you want to go ahead and zoom in and say, OK, What's the best I can do to look at the silicon? So I'm playing with the contrast to try, try to image the silicon. You can see kind of the outline of the silicon here. But the first thing you'll notice is any copper, any sort of metal underneath it immediately masks it out. So the moment these, this, so this, this chip is not mounted on a circuit board. The moment the thing goes on a circuit board, you're going to have more and more layers of copper and, uh, and, and solder uh, masking out the presence of the chip. So uh, let's take a little closer look at what a wire bond looks like. This is. And the 3D view is a little rendering that I made. It's a chip. The, you know, the wire comes down. It's put on the chip. It's pulled off to the side and then bonded on the circuit board. And they just do this over and over again. And if you were to go uh, in an x-ray, you would see sort of like this outline. And then the wire is coming off of the chip. Now let's imagine uh, that we want to go ahead and put an implant inside of a chip. Uh, on the unmodified version, the wire bonds come straight from the original bond pads down to the PCB. For the implant version, I've gone ahead and just placed a die on top of the die. I wire bond from the pads to the existing pads and then uh, stitch it back down to the, to the circuit board. Uh, double bonding onto pads is a well-established technology. They do it all the time. Uh, if you want to you know, sort of get a man in the middle effect, you can wire bond from the target pad and then wire bond back over it onto the board. That's also a technique that is uh, perfectly fine in wire bonding. Um, if you were to imagine what it looks like in an x-ray view, you would have a second chip on the inside, which, remember, is very hard to see. And the only delta you'll see is that some wire bonds are just a little bit longer um, inside the X-ray view. So it's, it, you know, it's detectable, but difficult. This is what an actual piggyback looks like in the X-ray. Um, this is the cross-section of the chip, um, you know, eight layers or so. And you can see the stitching of the wire bond going down uh, to the circuit board. Um, if you were able to actually get the edge of the chip and look at an X-ray edge on, you can see the stitching. The thing is, normally, it's mounted on the circuit board, so other components would be in the way. You wouldn't be able to get the x-rays through to it, so you have to pull the chip off to get this view. From the top view, all you see are straight wires. It's, there's nothing in the top view that really gives away the fact that this has so many chips um, inside the stack in an x-ray view. So wire bond implants uh, leverage mature commodity technology. It costs a few thousand dollars and maybe a couple weeks to develop. Um, and you can do this with all sort of you know, either outsource equipment, or if you're paranoid, you don't want someone to know about your operations, you can insource it for a couple hundred thousand bucks and buy the molding line outright. Um, and you can also, you don't have to develop custom chips for these exploits. You can use commodity MCUs or FPGAs that you buy in bare die form, put them inside of a chip, and go ahead and have your uh, implant deployed. The problem is it's, it is detectable in x-rays. So there is another technology that's uh, come out uh, called a through silicon via. So as the name implies, this is a piece of silicon. And there's now a via that goes from the front coming out the back side of the silicon. This height here is about 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters. This is a cross section of a through silicon via. If this may be about five or six years ago, this was exotic. Today, you can, if you buy any uh, graphics card that advertises HBM, the high bandwidth memory, they're using through silicon vias. It's a mass a production process. You can just sort of order it um, uh, from the fabs. Uh, so now, if you're to have a through silicon via chip and you were to execute the same implant, you just bond it on top of the existing pads and you wire bond on top of those, right? Um, there's no extension of the wire bonds. So if you were to go ahead and take a cross section of this implant, um, you know, this is the implant IC and this is the wire bonds. And I'm just going to just cut right through those wire bonds here. This is what it looked like. You have your package substrate, your target silicon chip. This is your man in the middle IC. Through, through silicon vias with bumps going down the chip, and then your wire bonds coming off the top. Um, if you were to look at this in the x-ray view, um, the unmodified version versus the modified version, uh, you wouldn't see any difference in terms of bond wire lengths. You just have to sort of rely on the hope that you can see this ghostly bit of silicon. Remember, the silicon itself is rather transparent to x-rays. Um, so 
Wire bond with silica, through silicon via implants um, does require a bespoke man in the middle chip because it has to match the, the bond pattern and through, through silicon via is sort of a newish technology so you can't just buy commodity parts. Uh, so it's a bit more expensive and difficult to pull off but it's harder to detect with x-rays. Um, so what about this other packaging technology called wafer le level chip scale packages, WLCSPs. This is like, this is um, a, just a random one I had on my desk, took a picture of it, you can see it's a silicon die and then literal solder bumps put on the silicon die. This is actually becoming a super popular packaging format. If you look inside of a, an iPhone motherboard, like 80% of the chips by count use this packaging technology. The cool thing about this is that essentially they've done a lot of the hard work for you in terms of getting an implant in there. You've got the bare die, so you don't have to source the bare die. You've got the, you've got the things already balled out into large pads. And so if you were to look at the cross section of a normal device, you can see You've got your solder balls, your target silicon, and then some backside passivation to protect the IC. You go ahead and you um, throw in your implant. You just go ahead and you just stack it right on top of the bumps, and then you have the solder balls on top of your implant, and now you have um, basically an undetectable implant on the inside of your chip using uh, through silicon via technology. Um, so if you want to try and detect this, uh, through an x-ray, um, it's going to be difficult to detect because the solder balls, as mentioned before, will mask a bit of what's going behind it inside the x-ray machine. So even if you can tilt the chip a bit, it's a little bit difficult to tell that you have another chip on top of a chip. And if you're to optically inspect, actually a lot of these chips already have a seam on the edge because, as I mentioned before, there's a backside passivation coating. So it's easy to confuse that seam with, for example, uh, what might be another layer of silicon that's been put in between your chip. And, uh, and, the, and the chip that's, uh, the, sorry, the man in the middle chip between the chip that you want to have on your board. Um, so wafer level chip scale implants, um, the pros of them is they're logistically much easier actually than wire bond, wire bond implants because for a wire bond implant, you have to source the target chips in bare chip form. That can be a little bit of a trick. You have to bribe someone, you have to work with someone inside the company to get the bare die out. Um, uh, there's no package to reverse engineer, you don't have to redo a package, it's, it's just the chip. Um, and uh, the through silicon vias and the wafer level chip scale packages are both commodity technologies. There's no, there's no new tech I'm proposing here, this is off the shelf stuff. The con is that it requires you to fabricate a custom template for every single chip you're trying to exploit. So you have to make a piece of silicon that has a through silicon vias at the right locations for every single chip you want to attack. I estimate it would probably cost in the mid hundreds of thousand of dollars to set one of these up. You don't have to do it in a cutting edge fab. You can do it in sort of a you know, 130 nanometer, 180 nanometer fab to go ahead and build those chips. So it's not as expensive to fab the chip. Um, but the real pro of this is ex extremely hard to detect. Um, there's almost no x-ray footprint, almost no visual footprint. So that's uh, adding an IC in a package. Let's talk about substituting very briefly, substituting ICs in a package. Um, this is where uh, instead of putting another chip on top of a chip or using the existing chip, you just get rid of the chip, put your own chip in. So you know, system controllers are oftentimes little embedded ICs. You can go ahead and just swap it out with another one. Um, another objective you could have is, uh, for example, on every uh, DRAM DIM, um, you have a little sort of SPD, a little I squared C double E prom that tells you sort of what the characteristics of that DIM is. It's supposed to be a certain amount of bytes large. If you put another chip inside that I squared C package, it has a much larger capacity. As long as you don't try to read or write past the end, the system will never know. Um, you won't detect that issue. And so, and, and this is a relatively trivial thing to do, to go ahead and take an existing SPD memory, mark it as um, sort of a lower capacity than it is, put it inside your, your, di your DIM, and now you have a convenient little cache where you can go ahead and store um, keys you want to exfiltrate or code you want to use later on, something like that. Um, so this is, a, this is also another sort of attack venue that is feasible um, and useful in certain situations and very hard to detect because um, it, and when you look at it in the x-ray, there's one chip, it looks legit, it's inside of a package. And finally, uh, there's the uh, subject of modifying the chips themselves, right? So I kind of consider this the ultimate attack, um, backdoors inside the IC. Uh, of course, as the previous talk had indicated, some manufacturers backdoor their ICs for you by putting management engines in with um, all kinds of fun uh, flaws in it. Um, but if, if someone is trying to harden their chips against you, uh, if you can get uh, backdoor inside the IC, they're very hard to detect, they're, they can be difficult to attribute, and they, they're, of course, very persistent. Um, so how would this happen? There's actually multiple insertion opportunities uh, during the process flow of making a chip. So when you start with 
your high-level chip design at the very top here, you start with a piece of RTL, piece of code, and then either you're the type of shop that owns the set of uh, the tools internally to build that into a mass set, or you don't. And um, if you don't own those, then uh, you're actually just sending off a, a netlist to a third-party service, and that third-party service can tamper with the netlist. So it's a relatively easy way um, to get a, a, a backdoor into the chip. Even if you do own the backend flow, um, you know, there's uh, opportunities such as tampering with the hard IP and also mass tampering uh, to go ahead and get implants in. So we'll talk a little bit more about each of these. So uh, netless tampering. So there's kind of two, um, if you're to split the flows into two major categories, if you're to spin your own chip, there's one called the ASIC, Application Specific Integrated Circuit Path, here on the left. And the right-hand side is called COT, Customer Owned Tooling. The big difference between the two is on this one, um, you've, uh, you've got several extra headcount and spent several million dollars extra to buy those tools that you need to go ahead and turn RTL into a mass set. Um, and typically, it's used only for like, high-performance applications where you can justify the investment of COT. For sort of like cheaper support chips, things like server BMCs, disk controllers, set-top boxes, the controllers inside of uh, your, your memory chips, whatever it is, these jelly bean ICs, you, it doesn't pay off to buy the whole flow. So a lot of times, people just hand off RTL to third-party service to go ahead and implement those chips. Um, here's an example of uh, one vendor that uh, advertises a service called Sockio Next. They did about a 1.3 billion revenue in 2016 estimated. And they, from their own page, they have like, you know, here are, the, here are the stages where you can hand off a design to us. You could just hand a specification. We'll do the whole thing for you. You can hand off RTL, or you can just hand off a netlist. Of course, on this whole back-end side here, from physical design all the way to testing to, sh to, to the shipment, there's opportunities to put stuff inside. In fact, what you often find is that these ASIC vendors will put backdoors in for you, not under any malicious guise, but just to help them with testing. It's their responsibility to yield to you a working chip. And so they're going to go ahead and put sort of effectively test access ports on the inside, which are not going to be within you know, the, you know, the RTL that you've hardened. And, uh, and can go ahead and serve as a, a, a back door. So OK, um, if you care about security, you're going to do COT, right? So I'm safe with COT. The problem is, is that even if you're doing, you have all the tooling yourself, you have these blocks that are called hard IP blocks. This is a view of what you might look at, uh, at on the back end of your place and route. You have these small little boxes here, which is all your standard cells that are being placed down, your, your NANs, your flip flops, whatever it is. And then literally, you just have this block called this blob of SRAM, right? Um, and the Foundry will not share with you the actual layout of the SRAM. They insert it to you after you hand back to them your mass patterns. So when you ship a mass pattern to the Foundry, it's got these big holes in it for things like RFN analog, PLLs, ADCs, DACs, and band gaps, things like RAM, things like ROM, things like eFuse. So you know, the reason why the manufacturer doesn't share these with you is that RAM density is one of the metrics that really drive the cost of a chip. Chips have a lot of RAM on the inside. They spend a lot of money and effort optimizing those layouts. They're not going to let that layout leak to another foundry so you can get that edge uh, in terms of cost. So they're, so they're just not going to share with you what those blocks look like. You just have to trust them that those blocks perform to spec. E-fuse is another thing that's very hard to get from the manufacturer review. I have accounts from people who work for very large companies that do, are very security conscious, and they want to get the eFuse blocks to audit. And the best they can do is they can get test chips back, and they have to send them to a third-party service to delay and reverse engineer to make sure that they're working correctly. The, the manufacturer will just not share with you the eFuse IP. Um, pad rings also as well. For various reasons, manufacturers don't want to share those with you. So basically, even if you do a COT tooling flow, everything you need to backdoor your RTL is going to be a hard IP block. And you're just trusting a manufacturer, a fab, not to do anything wrong with it. Even if you were able to convince a fab to give you all of those blocks and you can review the GDS2 mass before it goes out, the mass themselves go through a lot of processing. So if you were to draw just, well, let's think about the problem in the first place. If you, you know, people heard like, okay, we're at 14 nanometers, something like this, and that's a number of people bat around. How big are the photons they use to image that? 193 nanometers, okay? You're using photons that are this big to make transistors that are this big. This, something doesn't work out there, right? Some magic has to happen. So when you have your mass pattern that looks like an L like this, it gets turned into this green outline, which then turns into this red printed outline. This is not even at four, 14 nanometers. To do the 14 nanometer stuff, they actually take your mask and fracture it into multiple sub-masks and use a whole bunch of other techniques to do this. And this is all done after you hand your mask to them. The, main, the fab runs a whole bunch of algorithms to, to just 
tamper with your data, essentially, and turn it into something they can manufacture. Um, and then also, the masks themselves have to be perfect, right? Masks aren't born perfect, so there's a whole industry around editing masks after they're made. So this is a guy, this is a manufacturer, they're advertising how they can go ahead and take masks that have broken lines and fill in uh, the lines that are broken, they have excess material and remove the excess material and they can go and print it. Well, guess what? Mask editing is the perfect opportunity to go ahead and if you can control that mask editing process, even if you've vetted everything all the way down and you don't control that mask editor, someone can go ahead and tamper with your layout. What can they do? For example, dopant tampering. There's a, there's a paper um, you can check out where essentially uh, you can, instead of, there's, and this one's a very difficult one to detect because there's no morphological change to the polysilicon, no change to the metal layers. All that's happened is the trace amounts of atoms that control whether you have an N or P-type transistor have been modified, right? So this is a very difficult one to detect, and this one can be uh, done entirely at a mask level edit. Um, spare cell rewiring, so, uh, you know, ASICs are expensive. You don't tape them out without any sort of, uh, sort of silver bullets in your pocket to save you in case of a bug. So when you have your final layout, this is an example of all the little standard cells. They'll look for empty slots. The tool automatically inserts spares, things that aren't connected to anything else but already have essentially all the logic wired in. So later on, if you're like, oops, I, you know, I screwed up my logic, you don't have to spin a whole set of masks. You just have to make a couple mask layer changes to go ahead and, and, um, and, uh, and uh, fix your design. And so this is oftentimes done as a mask edit. Guess what? The thing that's good for the designer is also good for uh, the attacker. Uh, and you can do just simple, subtle things like signal bypasses. If you look at the design of a flip-flop standard cell, it turns out every standard cell gives you both the true and the inverse of the signal. This is just a feature that every cell has built into it, whether you want it or not. So if you want to take a signal and invert it, you don't have to add anything. You're just changing the contact point from the true output to the not true output, right? So that's a, a pretty useful primitive to have. Or if you have a multiplexer and you want to just go ahead and say, instead of, you know, if the, you know, if the hash checks out, go through, from signal A, or if not, go through signal B, you want to always go through signal B. It's just a matter of changing a contact from being uh, here, the select pin, just wiring it to power or ground. They're both next to each other. They just have tiny little changes in the mask. And remember, these masks have billions and billions of features. It's looking, you're looking for, like, you know, a, a literal needle, needle in a haystack. So that's sort of the, the what you might uh, find people doing to attack uh, on a supply chain. So the question now is, like, where can these sorts of things happen? So uh, let's first start with you, right? You're uh, wherever you are, and you want to order something. It comes from a distributor via a courier. Um, there are documented um, attacks where people intercept packages uh, on route via FedEx open them up, put an implant on the inside, and then ship them on to you. So that's, that's a, a well-known issue. Um, there's also the issue that, particularly if you're ordering from Amazon, you have returns that go back to the depot. So you can have a hacker inside the customer base buying stuff, and if they don't want to be very specific about it, or they just want to be specific within the distribution region, they can go ahead and tamper with the product, say it's broke, send it back, and Amazon will happily sell it to someone else without checking it. Again, and so even if you have uh, tamper stickers, for example, they can be removed. This is actually a really great talk by um, uh, Dimitri Netos and a bunch of other guys at 35C3. I encourage people to check it out if you want to learn more about sort of the attacks they can do uh, at this level called wallet.fail. And they demonstrate they can move, remove the tamper evidence seal and sort of the chaos that these tamper evidence seals and the attempt to try and secure this can happen in the, in the supply chain. So. Um, that's sort of at the distributor and courier level. So now let's think a little bit deeper into the supply chain. How big does that attack surface go? Well, where does the distributor get this stuff from? It comes from a manufacturer. It goes overseas. It goes through customs. There's certain single points of entry, right? And so this is where we sort of now enter these like sensational stories about like the big hack, right, uh, from, from Bloomberg Business Week. Um, because it's actually just a huge attack surface, places where people can go ahead and inject um, um, uh, implants. So not only do you have customs and the factory that does the box build, the, ba the box build factory has to buy their components from other factories. There's distributors, they're interacting with the gray market, um, and then you have the test and IC packaging houses, which are separate from the chip fab houses, which are separate from the mass prep houses, which are separate from the actual house that does your design. So all of these um, different actors are opportunities uh, for someone to go ahead and, and put an implant. So the question now becomes how well, can we target that implant? How far away can we get 
from a particular target and say, I just want it on that one, not everybody, but just that guy, right? And so there's a trend in supply chain logistics called build to order, or mass customization, or custom turnkey order, just some of the, the terms for it. So if you order something on the Apple web store, uh, and they'll send you a tracking number, and it comes from Shenzhen, China, and you can track it all the way to your doorstep, right? And the world is great, because now the world is very small. The world is also very targeted. So um, essentially, I've visited some of these uh, flavoring facilities inside China. Um, there's a, 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 a facility called CTS um, that I went to once. And for example, when you order a laptop, you say, I want to have like, you know, the secure hard drive and the hardened OS. I want to have the secure enclave and I, all these other features. Guess, guess where that gets built? There's some guy inside this factory who's just you know, going ahead and putting all these things into the laptop for you next to all the other ones. And you know, I can walk into those factories and just sort of take a look around, right? So um, uh, and another thing is, for example, uh, uh, during the fulfillment process, they use a system called pick to lights. Um, so th the blue bins in the back are the inventory, and then the, the, the packages in front are the boxes going to customers. What happens is the worker just gets a printed order. There's a bunch of words on it, but basically barcodes. They scan the barcode, a light turns on, they pick out of the bin, they put in the box, they seal it, they ship it, right? So the, the neat thing about this from a supply chain attack standpoint is that you don't need to buy off any of these workers to go ahead and get them to put something into a very targeted box for a particular customer. You just need to be able to go ahead and install another bin at the end, install another code for the software that has your special inventory in it. Those workers continue with uh, their daily operations. And then when a particular zip code comes up, particular customer name, whatever it is, they get the special version versus the regular version. And so, uh, and so it's not like you have to go into the facility and bribe every single person from top to bottom to get this to happen. Just a couple weak points um, um, need to be knocked over to go ahead and get a very targeted implant towards a customer. Um, and the other thing I want to know is that swapping chips is actually easy. I mean, if you haven't done it before, um, it, it, it feels hard, but uh, you know, there's people uh, whose day job essentially is swapping chips off and putting them on. Um, there's an example here, a YouTube video, you can go and see someone basically pulls off the NAND flash from an iPhone motherboard and replaces it within 30 minutes, right, with, a, with what looks like pretty simple equipment, and the equipment's not that expensive um, to do. So, uh, so from, this, from the perspective of, like, do we have to worry about inventory sitting on a shelf post-manufacturing that has a chip swapped on it? Yes, that's a real possibility. That's not something that's hard to do. Um, so people have oftentimes asked me, it's like, hey, you know, what do you think? Is this, is this thing real or not? I mean, so the problem is, is that everything that leaked seems feasible, technically, right? But f for me, the actual scheme as reported doesn't pass Occam's razor. They put a lot of effort in to develop a really, really tiny implant that you can detect by just looking at it, right? And this is a country where they have all the manufacturing capability in the world. They can do anything, right? And so if I were to actually, probably what my guess is what happened is that something did happen, but the details were changed to, for operational reasons to not leak the actual thing that's happening. But if I were, if I had those kinds of resources, I would develop sort of a set of through, scale, uh, through silicon via WLCSP implants that I can go ahead and put between chips. They're essentially indetectable. And I have multiple options for putting them into the supply chain. If I have to be on one side of the ocean, um, I can go ahead and put them all the way from the IC test and packaging to the box build site. Um, and then if I need to have a very targeted operations in the target country, uh, a mobile rework station um, costs not a lot of money. The actual tools you need to remove a chip and put them on costs about a couple hundred bucks on the market. Um, and, you, and within five minutes to an hour, depending on the complexity of the box and the amount of um, you know, the you know, sort of other things they use, like goo to hold on the chip and whatnot, you can typically pull off the chip and replace it within about an hour. Um, and so there's multiple opportunities from the courier to customs to distributor to, to returns and exchanges to go ahead and um, put a very directed implant um, towards particular customers. So um, the key takeaways from this talk um, that if, if I were to sorry, put them out there, um, supply chains are hard even when security is not a concern, right? I have to deal with all kinds of shenanigans, fakes, um, and you know, people trying to sell me stuff that isn't real, uh, even when it's not a security issue. Um, and in this case, the red team isn't caring about my secrets. They just want to make some money, right? So, and the interesting thing is that this, um, this ecosystem uh, essentially has developed a large amount of commodity technology that can be readily adapted 
uh, to the manufacturer of, of sort of implants at the end of the day. So now you can do a wire blind implant for your low tens of thousands of dollars. And if you want to do this uh, wafer level chip scale uh, uh, implant, it's probably a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, and also, it's got a very large attack surface. So you have everything from workers and couriers. It's a very porous transient community with not a lot of loyalty to their employers. Um, you have distributors and factories who have misaligned interests to yours. They, you know, these distributors and factories, they, they have a profit motive. They're not necessarily caring about your security. And then finally, um, the bill to order practices that we all sort of love and take advantage of these days really extends that attack surface with great specificity over borders and across multiple companies. Um, and so, that's it.